Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello, and welcome to episode 49 of the Play Podcast, where we explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. Before the curtain rises on our play today, I should say that there are a few occasions during the recording where the quality of the sound is not what we normally like it to be. We recorded our conversation with Will Johnson and Tony Marshall remotely while they were on site at the Old Vic Theatre. I hasten to say, however, that it is very much worth sticking with it to hear the unique insights that Will and Tony have on this great play. Thank you. The curtain rises on the rundown office of a local taxi company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is not an ordinary taxi company, however. The cabs and drivers are unofficial, unlicensed, because regular taxis will not travel into this largely black neighborhood of Pittsburgh. The time is 1977. Signs on the back wall of the office spell out the boss's rules. Be courteous, keep car clean, no drinking, no overcharging. The boss, Becker, is holding information that he has not shared with his crew of drivers. The business is in imminent danger because the building that they occupy has been targeted for demolition by the city for redevelopment. His crew are a collection of freelance characters, both old and young, including war veterans, an alcoholic, and all of whom depend on Becker and their cash earnings from his underground business. This is the setting for American playwright August Wilson's play, Jitney, which as we record this is being revived at the Old Vic in London in a vibrant, funny, and topical new production, the first in the UK in more than 20 years. The play was written in 1979 and first performed in Pittsburgh in 1982, but Wilson subsequently rewrote large parts of it in 1996, which led to multiple more productions around the United States before it was finally produced in New York in April 2000. It received its British premiere at the National Theatre in October 2001. August Wilson was born in 1945 in Pittsburgh and died in 2005 at the age of only 60. He's been described as the theater's poet of Black America, and he is perhaps best known for his series of plays known as the Pittsburgh or Century Cycle, which comprise 10 plays about the Black experience in America, each one set in a different decade of the 20th century. He won the Pulitzer Prize for two of these plays, namely Fences from 1987, and The Piano Lesson from 1990. And more recently, two of them have been adapted into films by Denzel Washington, that is Fences and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And Washington has vowed to help bring all of the plays in the Pittsburgh series to the screen. The revised version of Jitney became the eighth in that cycle. I'm delighted and privileged to be joined today by two members of the cast from the current staging of Jitney at the Old Vic. Will Johnson, who is playing Becker, the boss of the taxi firm, and Tony Marshall, who plays Fielding, a funny and poignant character with a fascinating backstory. Welcome, gentlemen. I know that you're both due on stage in a couple of hours, so thank you very much for taking time today. Before we kick off, I must do a very brief proper introduction to you both, however. Will Johnson has an extensive list of TV, film, and stage credits, including many familiar TV series such as Cracker, Waking the Dead, Waterloo Road, and Emmerdale. His stage appearances include Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead at this same old Vic Theatre, Sweat at the Donmar and in the West End, a UK tour of Glengarry Glen Ross, and Othello at the Royal Lyceum in Edinburgh, and King Lear at the Royal Exchange in Manchester, among many others. Tony Marshall has also had a prolific career as a TV actor in television series including Coronation Street, The Bill, All Quiet on the Preston Front, The Queen's Nose, Only Fools and Horses, Doctors, and Life on Mars. He's perhaps best known for his role as Noel Garcia in Casualty, which he made his own for 12 years until January 2021, when very topically his character died of COVID-19. Casualty's loss is very much the theater's gain with his return to the stage in Jitney. (laughs) So the formal bit over, guys. My first question is, how much did you know about this play and what drew you to want to do it? Firstly, I knew nothing about this play. The only August Wilson plays that I am familiar with is Fences, Piano Lesson, Marini's Black Bottom, and King Headley. So when I was approached about this play, I had no knowledge of it. 
read it and was totally blown away by the story and instantly wanted to do it because it's such a vibrant, vital story that I thought, I have to do this. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with Will. Um, I've only seen myself, Fences and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which I absolutely loved. I loved the performances in there and I loved the writing. The writing's so rich, it's so vibrant and it's it's just very poetic in his writing. And obviously when the opportunity came to actually audition for this, I was so, so nervous because I really, really wanted it. And I just said, right, I've got to relax. I've got to relax. relax. I haven't done any theatre for 17 years, by the way. And so it was a double-edged sword for me. But um, I did my best. I got a recall. And then I got another recall, which I'm going to discuss with the director at a later date. But um, (laughs) 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 Uh, eventually, on the third recall, I, I got offered the part and I cried. That's how much it meant to me to do this play. So you see, the best things are the things you want the most. Yeah. Surely. Yeah. yeah. And I think you also perform the best when you want it the most, probably. Absolutely. That's great. One of the things we were just chatting about before we came on air is that this is a distinctive play for a number of reasons. Being at the Old Vic, not only is the cast all black, but the cast of characters is all black. And it's written by a black American playwright. And I don't think we see that very often at a theater such as the Old Vic. So this is important too, isn't it? Was this important to you? Yes, um, this is this is a seminal moment in a sense that, you know, this has never been done before. And when you do something like this, it's groundbreaking. It sort of changes the course of theatre. It also introduces people who are not familiar with these type of plays, with these type of stories, with these type of characters to experience something new. So for me, it sort of ticks all the boxes. Yes, you know, on the political correctness side, you kind of go, oh, yeah, that's nice. That's that's great. But then going further than that, actually, this is about education. The Old Vic has a core following of people who go to see plays here on a regular basis. You know, so then they've come to see this and that will change their perceptions. It'll broaden their horizons and hopefully encourage them to explore different stories and that's what theatre is all about it's about yes it's entertainment but it's also it can be educational as well and informative you know there's a plethora of plays and stories out there and this is what we do as practitioners we go into places and we change people yeah hopefully we hope to do it struck me i had this my own personal anecdote i came out of the theater after seeing the show guys and uh I was standing outside taking a picture of the front of the theater and someone else right beside me was doing the same thing. And I said, did you see the show? And he said, yeah, it's the first time I've ever been to the theater. Wow. Wow. I said, really? Did you like it? Yes, fantastic. And he said, I'll be back. And I thought that was transformational. That's the power of theater. Yeah, that's amazing. Brilliant, brilliant. I want to ask you, let's start at the beginning. One of the obvious things I want to clear up first is the title of the play. I, for one, didn't know what a jitney was. So can you help explain for listeners what is the source of the title? What does jitney mean? Well, um, jitney, as far as we are aware, is a slang term for unlicensed cabs. And jitney was the actual price, which was five cents when it first started back in the day. And that's what it, um, the local cab stations would charge. Okay, so jitney is the slang for the nickel, right? Yeah. And then I noticed now in 1977 and on stage in your production, the fare is like three or four dollars, depending on where you pick up from. And I love the idea that every time you answer the phone to a customer, you have to tell the customer what color car yes. you're arriving in. Yes. Because you're unofficial. There's no taxi sign on the top of your car, is there? That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. For example, mine's a green car. And mine's a black car. <laughs> yeah, I love that detail. And here's another piece of research I picked up, which I don't know whether you guys came across this. Apparently, when Wilson took his mother to see the first local production in Pittsburgh, they arrived by Jitney. Did they really? Oh, wow. <laughs> that was amazing. I love that. <laughs> so we got the title. Now, what I usually like to do is to give listeners who don't know the play and may not get a chance to see it this time, a summary of what actually happens or a little bit of an introduction to some of the main characters. And I know this may involve some spoilers. So anyone who is still planning to see it now, 
you can wind ahead or come back and listen to us later after you've seen this. <laughs> but I wonder, guys, between you, whether we could just give a really potted summary of what goes on in this play. Uh, you're passing the buck between you there. <laughs> um, basically, the story is about a group of jitney drivers and where they work, the area is being threatened with demolition. That's the overriding thing that is looming over. Within that, we have the dynamics of the characters. So you have my character, Becca, who is the boss of the Jitney station. You have Tony's character, who Fielding, who is the, um, how would you describe the character? Uh, I would describe him as dependent on alcohol. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> then you have the local gossip, which is Turbo, yeah. who gets into everybody's business. You have Dub, who I would say sits on the fence yeah. as such. And he's also a Korean vet. You also have Youngblood, who is the youngest member of our crew, who is an ex-Vietnam Vietnam vet. And is a young man who is trying to better his life. Then we have the local numbers man, mm -hmm. called Sheeny, who comes in with his big afro and his shiki. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and uh, he basically uses the office to run his numbers. So basically, I would say the lottery. Yeah. yeah. He runs the lottery from Becca's office. Yeah. Not a legal one. No, no, no. 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 It's, it's all like underground. Then you also have the character Rena, who is Youngblood's girlfriend. And there's a dynamic going on between their relationship. And then we also have one of our local... Um, how would you describe Fillmore? Fillmore, is, yeah, yeah he, he's he, a regular he's, customer. He's a regular customer. Yeah, pops in every now and then. He, he works in the hotel locally somewhere, doesn't he? Yes, <laughs> he works in, in the, the local hotel. He's been yeah. there for six years. He's never been late. And um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's worked every day. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a lovely character. Yes. And what about, you're missing one, I think. You're missing one? Your son, your son. Oh, yes. There is um, Becca's son called Booster, who has been locked up in the state penitentiary for over 20 years, who finally gets out, who then comes to see his father. Yeah, and his backstory is amazing, of course. The reason he was put in penitentiary, do you want to just tell us what he did? Basically, he was dating a young white girl behind her father's back. One night, her father finds her and Booster together in her car doing the wild thing. <laughs> Daddy flips out, Booster beats him up, Booster gets arrested. And unfortunately, the young woman says that Booster raped her. And so Booster is released on bail, goes straight over to her house the next day and shoots her dead on the front porch. And that's why he ended up in the state penitentiary, originally to be executed, which was then commuted down to life. So he spent 20 years in prison and he's come out and um, he's come to see his daddy. Yes. And that's an extraordinary story in itself, isn't it? The way he shoots the girl who betrays him, the shock of the white girl betraying him. Yeah. But of course, the other thing is that your character, Becker, the father, refuses to visit his son in prison for those whole 20 years. Yeah. So there's a breach between them. Yeah. One of the great strengths of the play is it just as we just described is the range of characters, isn't it? Each of whom have a really engaging identity and their own narrative. So structurally, it's a, it's like a, an ensemble piece, isn't it? Revolving around you, Will, as Becker, and the office that acts as a hub. We don't go outside the office. The characters keep drifting in and out. That's their sort of home in a way. They come together there. Yeah. And I thought it was fascinating the way those stories are interweaved and he creates these lovely characters. And it somehow feels like a glimpse or a microcosm of a bigger world that they're inhabiting, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It feels like they're part of this larger community in Pittsburgh. And you feel it's really rooted and set in that community, don't you? Yeah. I mean, what's so, what's so great about the play that August has constructed is that, one, this was his first play that he wrote. And the challenge of writing a play set in one room basically, because hmm. that's what it is. So everything that happens, happens in that room. And what's so lovely is you've got all these different people. You know, every character has a story. 
even Fillmore, who is like what you would call the smallest recurring character, even he has a story. Each time he comes in, his story is moved forward. And August has this great ability to create these characters that gives all the actors an opportunity to shine. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, they all have their own time, don't they? They all get enough due time and they have enough depth and story and, and they're distinctive. It's fantastic. But the other thing, the way this structure works, I think, is that there are a series of conflicts between two individual characters as well, aren't they? That, yeah. that where some of the drama comes from between Youngblood, you mentioned Youngblood and his partner, Rena, in their relationship. Becker and you, Tony is fielding, they have a bit of a set too because... Becker wants to fire Fielding at one stage because he's drinking on the job. Not unreasonably, you think. So there's a bit of conflict going on there. And between Youngblood and Turnbow, who's stirring it all up with Youngblood. Yeah. And then Becker and his son, who we just talked to, who's just arrived after these 20 years. But let's start with the, the Becker and, and his son relationship. Becker, in a way, will is the center of the play. He runs the show. Let's just talk about his character first. How would you describe what sort of man he is? What are the key elements of his character? I would say that when we first meet Becker, I would say one of the key elements of this man is that he's at a point in his life where he's stagnant. You know, he's kind of running backwards, really. I mean, he's working, he's earning a living, he's doing his thing. But, you know, there's no forward motion, there's no progression, because he's at a point in time where he doesn't know what to do with his life. There's the imminent threat of the business being shut down because of the demolition of the building, which he has not told his drivers about. He's held on to this information for two weeks. And had Dub not spoken to Clifford next door to find out what's going on, would he still have held on to that information? Yeah. And this is really imminent. It's like they're going to shut it down in two weeks' time or something, right? They're going to shut it down like next week or whatever and then also on top of that is the knowledge that his son is getting out of prison his son who he's not seen and he's not spoken to in 20 years he didn't go to the trial he didn't go to see him in prison and we took the road that becca has not spoken about that situation to anyone not even his current wife lucille it's like a chapter that he has completely shut off. And he believes he's moved forward, but he actually hasn't moved forward. And then throughout the play, there is a scene between Dub and Becca where you find out that Becca is stagnant. Yes, because he says he's been, I mean, he's been running this business for 18 years and he's and he's tired, isn't he? Yeah. So when the, this threat, he doesn't really seem to have it in him to fight, to keep it going. Yeah, yeah. There's no more fight in him. When we meet Becker, he's a spent force. But then that's great because then as the play progresses, we see this man or the former man, in a sense, re-emerge. So what is it you think that brings that out at him? What is the catalyst that he decides? Because he does decide he's going to fight for the business, doesn't he? Facing his demons. Mm. And his demons really is his son. Because until he can cross that bridge... He's not going anywhere. Yeah. One of the things that we missed, but is relevant here, is that Becker's first wife and mother of Booster died. Yes. At the time that Booster goes to court and is convicted. In fact, she dies in a sense of a broken heart, I guess. Is that is that fair to say? Absolutely. Completely. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. And Becker blames Booster for this, which is, I guess, the reason he doesn't, he, he disowns him, so to speak. He won't go to visit him and... And uh, when he comes out of prison, he doesn't know how to deal with him. He initially is rejecting him because he blames him for his wife and, and Booster's mother's death. But what's really interesting as well in that relationship and in some of the other relationships, I think, is that Wilson doesn't actually make it clear cut which side he favors or that we are supposed to favor in any of these debates that they have or arguments that they have between each other. That's the brilliance of his writing, you know, is that he really does create two sides to an argument yeah yeah and i think that's the brilliance and that is life there are ways to every story mm -hmm. whichever side we come down on depends on our own persuasions 
So there's no right and there's no wrong. It's just like, okay, here are the arguments. That's his point of view. That's his point of view. Go. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and you see it from both perspectives of Booster and Becker in there. You see both their stories and they both have reasonable points of view. We're not going to have time to get into all the detail about how they debate this, but they, but you know, they both have rational and emotional uh, legitimate perspectives. Yes. Yes. And in your case, Tony, with Fielding and your dispute with Becker, I mean, initially you think, well, of course, Becker's right. He's got to fire the drunk. You can't be driving around like this. But then we don't really feel that way, do we? We, f- we feel compassion for you, don't we? Don't we think actually Becker's going too far here? Yeah, I mean, well, when you see, uh, I don't want to give too much away about that, but when they do have this spat where he has to fire Fielding, he doesn't want to do it because him and Fielding get on really well. And he actually feels for Fielding. But it's only when Dub says, look, you're a shadow of yourself. Come on, fix up. Do something about this. You're letting the place go down. You're letting the man come in here drunk and driving people around. When are you going to do something about it? It comes all on top of Becker, all on top of him. And then I come in and I'm having a little nip, as it were, in the office. And unbeknown to him, you know, Fielding is shocked at uh, Becker's reaction. Where has this come from? You know, I've been, I've been doing this for years. And now you're telling me I've got to stop drinking. Hold on. And now you're firing me? What's going on here? So, yeah, it is a, it's a very nice part of the play that we get to see Becco really toying with himself. He has to make this decision. He has to be strong and fire this man. Otherwise, you know, I will kill somebody. Yeah, it's like it's a, it's a small thing he can fix. Yeah. He may not be able to fix the big things, but there's something he could do, which is start with that, maybe. Exactly. There is a wonderful moment, I think, that indicates the compassion that Becker has as well, Will, isn't there? Because he looks like it's a done deal. He's fired him. And you, Tony, have given up, essentially. You've virtually accepted it. You're out the door. But there's a moment where he says, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very quietly done. But it's what we as an audience, interestingly, are hoping for. We don't want to see you chucked out the door, even though, you know, we understand why rationally Becker would do this. But, you know, we, we feel for him. Let's talk a bit about um, Youngblood and what he represents. Because one of the things that's interesting, I think, about the play is it is it's set in 1977. This is a time of change in Western societies in America, particularly. The 70s are a decade of social unrest, of civil rights and anti-war protests, the rise of feminism, etc. And there seems to be a sense of changing generations in the play, isn't there? There's the youth represented by... Youngblood and Rena and Booster. And then there's you older guys and um, your view of the world and their view of the world and what the expectations are. And I wondered what you thought, you know, is being said about that, because partly it's to do with race and what people's expectations are about what you can do with your life at that point in late 1970s in America. What opportunities are there? How is it different from what your generation have grown up with? That seems to be one of the main, one of the big themes that's represented by this range of different age characters. Yeah, there's a wonderful scene between Youngblood and Dub, where Dub eloquently breaks it down and he kind of makes Youngblood understand the difference between his generation and our generation and the opportunities that were around when we were his age opportunities that he has now because basically dub says to him look all this blame on the white man that's absolute crap just an excuse it's just an excuse because at the end of the day as he says the white man is not studying you he's studying what he's doing he's not studying you the individual yeah i mean he says what he's not paying you any mind hell they don't even know you're alive exactly yeah, yeah. And I think and I think that I think was August Wilson's way of also saying to the black community, you can't blame everything on the white man. You've got to take responsibility for yourself. Mm-hmm. A lot of what is happening in your life is because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're not putting in the work. You're not putting in the consistency. You're not putting in the dedication. You're not willing to fight because, you know, just because of slavery and this and that and what have you, don't use that as an excuse to give up. If anything, 
use those things as a spur. Yeah, fight harder. To actually fight harder. Know that there are many people who didn't make the journey, who died so that you could be where you are now. So, you know, use that as something to inspire you. Don't just sit back and say, oh, you know, I can't because of the white man just and the white man's that. It's like, no. It's like them wanting to demolize the area has nothing to do with young bud wanting to buy a house. No, he somehow takes it personally that it's a white conspiracy. And, you know, Dub is saying, no, don't take it personally. And again, that's August Wilson's voice speaking to the black community to say, don't take things personally. Most of the time, it's not. It's nothing to do with you, per se. Mm -hmm. You can't ignore the fact that institutional prejudice still exists. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, I think you're right. Dub encourages young blood to, to go to school, to make more of himself. And it's just sort of suggesting a theme that that previous generation have been fighting for your opportunities. Yes. You have helped create these opportunities. You're standing on the shoulders of those who've gone before to some degree. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as he said, when I was his age, the only thing he'd get a job doing was bussing dishes, running elevators, cleaning up toilets. It ain't like that now. You can be anything you want. Yeah. But I was also intrigued, actually, because Youngblood is trying to move to buy a house in a different neighborhood. And I'm not entirely clear how much, you know, this neighborhood may be black or white. There is certainly some suggestion the estate agent's white. And so this is why Youngblood reacts that way. He thinks somehow the things are stacked against him because the estate agent is asking for more money. But it reminded me a little bit of the story from Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun about a black couple moving into a white neighborhood and the resistance that they might be facing. Is that, do you think that's what's going on? Is there a subtext to that? I don't know. I mean, uh, Penn Hills, let's say that Penn Hills is like you're moving from Brixton to, let's say, for argument's sake, Hampstead. So that is because they're getting out of the area. They want to come out of the area because they stay in the area. They're not going to get on. They're not going to progress. And they feel as if they move into a better area because obviously where they are is the projects. So it's, I would say, like middle suburbia, really. And it's a very interesting point that you're saying about have they moved to a white area or have they moved to a, an up-and-coming black area? We wouldn't know that in Pittsburgh at that time. So Penn Hills literally is just... It's a better place than they are. I could be reading too much into that. It's just that I, I actually found out in researching that Wilson's own family, a bit like Lorraine Hansberry's, moved to a largely white working class neighborhood when he was young and they were racially persecuted. Bricks were thrown through their window and they were forced to move. Yeah. Wow. Which is ex extraordinary. Yeah. So I don't know whether that was in the background, but, but anyway, race is a feature in the world that they inhabit. And that, he, as you say, he's moving out of in some way, but whether just economically as well, it's a thing of class. What I find very interesting about this play is that although there are elements of race within it and there are references to the white man, predominantly the play is about the dynamics of these characters, you know, their mm. dreams, their hopes, their aspirations. I mean, the whole of... Becker's story is about the dreams and the aspirations of his son that, you know, he thought, I'm going to take all of the crap so that my son can have a better life. Yeah, yeah. It's all about wanting to have a better life, wanting to move up the social scale, the economic scale, and to live that American dream, you know, free of the crap that surrounds it. So... Becker's way of doing that is the harder you work, the harder you work, the harder you work, the more focused, the more driven you are, is the better your life will eventually become. If you stick on this path and you just work hard and you work hard and you work hard, that's it. That's his ethos. I won't say too much about the scene between him and his son, but it's brilliant because it's that dynamic of father and son. This is what I hoped for you. Well, but this is what I hoped for myself. And we don't very often get to see that within the Black narrative, because for a lot of plays or things that have been done about Black people on TV or film or in theatre, is very sort of issue-led. This play breaks down to father and son. 
these are the hopes I had for you as a person. This is one of the reasons he's so upset or disappointed, isn't it? It's because those hopes for his son have been dashed. That's the reason why, you know. And again, even within the dynamics between Fielding and Becker, that's about mates falling out. Yes, we have the thing of the policies within the office. And because a particular policy has been broken, that's what then breaks down our relationship. The same way like with young blood, you know, when I talk about certain people don't haul, there's certain jobs I'll do and there's certain jobs I won't do. Actually, no, you do every job because that's the requirement of the job. But I think that's why Fielding feels so betrayed, doesn't he? Because he thinks there's something personal should override the policy thing, doesn't he? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's some bond there that he feels is being betrayed. Yeah. But I, I mean, it's interesting you're saying about fathers and sons. I mean, from Booster's perspective, one of the things that really struck me as well is there's this terrible moment that he tells a story of the rent collector coming to collect the rent from Becker when he was younger and how Becker kowtows to the rent collector instead of telling him where to get off. And Becker quite reasonably answers, well, you know, we needed a roof over our head and I had to compromise to support my family. But to the boy, it felt like his father was somehow less than he expected him to be. And that's such a powerful theme, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The disillusionment of a son seeing the frailties of the father for the first time and realizing that he's not the Superman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That he's like everyone. You said something about you was the same size as everybody else instead of being big man. And it's so beautifully and simply put, you were the same size as everybody else. Yeah, yeah. And shame brings a, a big part of it as well. You know, Becker is ashamed of his son. He's ashamed of his actions. And Booster was ashamed of his dad that he behaved that way. He should have told him where to go. Do you know what I mean? So shame features a lot in yeah. a piece as well. That's absolutely right, because, of course, Becker carries the shame in the community. We talked earlier about this being a community. And one of the things that, of course, hurts him is that he's forever stained in the community by, by what his son has done. Yeah, he, he became a deacon of a church. So he's a, a real high figurehead. And, you know, to have people gossiping about the deacon of the church and his son being a murderer, that's, 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 that's shame. That's shame. <laughs> that, that is. That's hard to, hard to live by, hard to walk around living that. Yeah. And so, yes, it's so much more than about race, because not only in the dynamics of the relationship to these characters, as you say, Will, but also the things they're facing, the things that concern them resonate today are true of so many people, not just, you know, the poor black neighborhood in 1970s America. There's this amazing speech where someone starts talking about, oh, it's Rena talks about the grocery money that's been stolen. <laughs> well, not stolen, but basically Youngblood lifts some of the grocery money that she's keeping back. And, you know, she has this amazing speech, which talks about how she's just husbanding the cash in order to put food on the table or pay the electricity bill or, and you're just going, oh my God, she's talking about today. Yeah, yeah. very true. The, the universal themes, yeah. what people go through, uh, resonated in this piece by um, August Wilson. And even though it's 1977, you could still come out of that and go, well, I'm still worried about my bills in 2022. Even more so. Even more so yeah. She talks about, you know, not sending her, her son to school hungry. That just seemed to resonate so strongly. Let's talk a bit about Rena. I know she's not here to tell us about this character herself, but she's only one, the only female character on the stage, eight other male characters. But she's a force to be reckoned with, isn't she? Yeah. No, she is. Yeah. She's a strong, young black woman. She represents the hopes and dreams of just wanting to become a family. She wants a nice little house with a picket fence. She wants the American dream. She wants the American dream. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, you know, with, with the social economic conditions that they find themselves in, it's going to take them longer to get that dream. You know, she, she does an accounting class as well. You know, he's got three jobs. So she's really trying her best to, to, to help a man. Yeah. But she's also an independent woman, isn't she? She's the character, I think, that does come from 1970s feminism or that we would recognize today. She stands up for herself. She talks about a more equal partnership in their marriage, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. yeah. Which I think might have been quite striking at the time. She was in the vanguard at that time in a way, yeah. wasn't she? Sure. I mean, what's so wonderful about her character is that, again, August Wilson, I mean, he's such an insightful man in the sense that he has constructed a play which is predominantly men, but then right in the heart of that, a female character 
who is just as strong. And again, that's his kind of ode or his kind of nod to the strong black woman who, who is full of integrity, is full of love, is full of hopes, is full of dreams, is responsible, not just for herself, but for her child and her man and her home. And again, not many pieces at that time actually portraying these characters. You know, even though the main thing is about the jitney station within that, he's also saying like the backbone behind a good, strong black man is a good, strong black woman. Mm. You know, so even though Youngblood gives a very, very good argument, Rena then comes back with a strong counter argument, which balances it out. And it's all about the balancing of these two people in order to work as one, which is why the scene starts where they're far apart. And then by the end of the scene, they're completely together because they both heard each other's arguments. They both respected each other's arguments and between them and go, okay, we're both on the same page. So let's work together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know that, that they have to do that, that he's not going to succeed without her. Yeah. And, and as you said, she's the strong woman holding it all together. And that's a, yeah. I think that is common to August Wilson, isn't it? Because, and Fences, is it Rose? Is she the mother in Fences? She's very powerful. Yeah. And I think Wilson himself, his mother may have been a single mother for a while and it was a very powerful figure in his life. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, she's just great. There's that wonderful moment where he's, okay, so one of the plot lines is that he's trying on the sly to buy this house. He hasn't told Rena he's actually buying this property. And he's doing this with the help of Rena's sister, which is how Turnbow stirs it all up, trying to suggest that Youngblood's running around with the sister, but he isn't. He's just trying to buy this house on the secret. But then when he comes clean and he tells Rena that he's buying this house, and instead of her going, oh, that's so lovely. Thank you so much. You have this fantastic moment where she goes, what? You're buying this house without me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you did the right thing, but, but you did it wrong. Yeah. And the whole audience are going, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, she's brilliant. Tony, I'm so sorry that it's taken us this long to get to talk more about your character, Fielding, because he's he's also wonderful. He's he's more complicated than we might think, isn't he? At first, you might just write him off. He's the sad alcoholic whose wife left him many years ago. But there's more to him, isn't there? More grit and intelligence somewhere. There in there, is. There is. I, mean, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but in the second half of the piece, you get to know why this man drinks. You get to know the journey that he's been on, the people that he's been around. And uh, he's a very sad character, to be fair. And uh, I've absolutely loved playing him. But I think in all communities, everyone knows alcoholic. But you can have different extremes of alcoholic. You can have the violent alcoholic, or you can have the, the touchy-feely alcoholic, or, you know, the crying alcoholic. But he comes from a place, uh, he's, got, he's got a good heart, and he's made mistakes. And those mistakes he's made is by drinking. But he's had, a, he's had some impressive past where he was a tailor for famous musicians. I didn't want the audience to know that, but thank you for that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. There's a spoiler. Okay, go back, guys. You didn't hear that. <laughs> well, no, that's fine. Yes, he, he was. He was a former tailor to some very famous people back in the day. And he was, he was that good. He was exclusive to one particular famous person. And he messed that up royally through drinking. He messed his marriage up as well through drinking. So we see he's a, he's a, a broken man, mm. you know? Yes. But tell me about what, what his holding on to this idea about his wife, because there's this lovely strain where he talks about his wife who's left him 22 years ago, but he still somehow believes she's going to turn up. She's going to come back. He does. He, he constantly dreams this. He dreams about her coming back and saving him from the drink and, you know, Again, another strong black woman that he hopes to save him from himself. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we don't get to know the ins and outs of her journey with him. But we just see this man who is yearning for the only woman that he's ever, ever loved. The weird thing is, isn't it? I don't know, Tony, whether you've sensed this or not, but that um, clearly it's a less than a long shot that this woman's going to walk back into his life 22 years later. <laughs> but there's something in his commitment, his dedication to retaining this memory or this hope 
it's something in that that you give them credit for. I don't know. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's of course delusion, but what is it? There's something romantic about it still, isn't there? Yeah, I suppose it's hope. He's hoping that one day she'll come back into his life and he'll he'll be forgiven. He's hoping that one day she'll come through that door and go, come on, I'm going to help you climb up that ladder and get you out of the bottomless pit that you find yourself in with a drink. But it keeps him going, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because he lights up at moments where he talks about her. Yeah. There's that great speech about the dream he has of her being in heaven and, and reaching down to help him. Yeah. A beautiful speech. But the other thing is that, you know, he's got some wisdom. He offers some counsel, doesn't he, to um, Booster when he comes out of prison? Yeah. He's got a, a great speech when Booster is trying to figure out what to do about his relationship with his father or his future of his life. Of course, he's, a, he's in a difficult stage and doesn't know what the future will hold or what he should do. And you have that wonderful speech about being in the treetop. And you, you have to know why you go up the tree. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know a paraphrase, but basically it's a metaphor for if you don't know why you're up the tree, when you come down the tree, you don't know what you should do next. Did you climb up to get some apples or was you run up by a bear? Yeah. Well, that's going to make a big difference to what you do next. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He has these gems of wisdom. <laughs> As I say, that just come from a place where his heart is good. And he, he can see the situation. Uh, and I feel as, as though that he would have treated Booster differently. He probably would have gone to see him in prison. Yes, yes. Probably would have gone to see him. He'd been disappointed. But because the shame that um, Becca feels, he can't do that. But I think that Fielding would have gone to see him if he could. But it's interesting that Turnbull, the gossip, he goes to see him in prison and not his dad. Ah. And he was, he was there at the trial. Okay, that's interesting, yes. Yeah. Now, I referenced a couple of those speeches and touched on the fact that they're they're quite poetic, I think. And I wanted to ask you both about the language in the play, because it's fantastic. It's it's musical, and I just said poetic, but how would you describe, how did it feel to you? There's a character of its own to this, isn't it? Yeah, there's a rhythm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Robert Wilson writes in, 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 in a certain rhythm, and if you break that rhythm, you know, it sticks out like a sore thumb. It's Shakespearean. <laughs> yeah. It's like learning all this world then is like learning Shakespeare. Exactly. If you miss out a word, you break the rhythm. There is a rhythm. And somebody did say something to me about August Wilson discovering the beauty and the power of the African-American way of speaking, especially in Pittsburgh, where he's from. So he really kind of honors that. And the way in which they speak, and it's like, the repetition, the grammar of how words are put together. It was literally like learning Shakespeare for me. And it was like, the minute you miss out a word, which we sometimes do, you can hear and, and you can hear and you can feel within yourself that you've kind of broken something. It's a bit like if you did that with Shakespeare. But it's incredibly fluent, isn't it? Completely yeah. fluent. But it's like, you know, but when you actually read it on the page and then when I was starting to get to learn it, my brain wanted to go one way, my mouth wanted to go another way. Yeah. So then you have to kind of readjust your brain and your mouth and kind of get those words inside your mouth, get your tongue moving, get your mouth moving so that you can get into that room. The same way, exactly the same way that when you're learning Shakespeare, because, because it's not how we speak as English people, doing an African-American dialect. Like they have a different rhythm to us. Yeah, has a completely yeah. different rhythm. Yeah, fabulous rhythm. And you guys are amazing. I, you know, you would have said that whole cast was American. It's just astounding. Wow. Oh, thank you. You. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things I didn't even think about, the fact that you weren't, because it was just so fluent and effortless. And it's wonderfully rhythmic. Actually, I read somewhere, Wilson, when he was young, did all sorts of odd jobs. He started writing in bars and cafes. I was going to say that. Okay, tell us. Because basically, in the research that I did, I found out that he did go to cafes and bars and he listened to people's conversations and wrote them down on a napkin. So a lot of the conversations that he has in his pieces are actual conversations that he's heard. Yeah, so it's a, it's an authentic voice, isn't it? it? Yeah, yeah. And someone described it as the poetry in the everyday language of Black America because that's what it is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's attuned to that, and it feels very authentic. Yeah, brilliant. I'm glad we talked about that. We talked at the very beginning about community. 
there's a dependency on each other. So when they come under threat, collectively, how do they respond to this threat? And then, and then yes, they've been going in and out and their lives are sort of touching, but when they're under this threat and it looks like he's going to close it up, you fear for them, don't you? You fear that they're going their separate ways. This is not necessarily going to work out well for any of them individually. Sure. So there's something in that, isn't there, about the power of community? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. I mean, I've kind of experienced it. So I used to live in Brixton for many, many years. And, you know, Brixton, a uh, very vibrant community. But I did notice that gentrification has come into that community and it's not the same as it was. You know, and, that, and that's unfortunate, but that is what they call, in inverted commas, progress. Or, 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 or is it? It's one of the themes, isn't it, because of that area of Pittsburgh that is being demolished, like so many other urban areas or cities around the world, where you have gentrification, displacement of people and the change that results and economically displaced, forced out, can't live in the same places anymore. Yeah. But also, I thought it was more personal, too, isn't it? Because there's this great line of, firstly, Fielding says, you know, that if they fight, if everybody sticks together, they, they won't be able to do anything to them whether that's true or not, but you know they've got more chance that they stick together. But also, I think it's your line, isn't it, Tony, that you repeat several times, you've got to have somebody you can count on. That's right. Yeah, it is. You do. And you do have to have somebody you can count on within your community to help you. You know, uh, you've got to have somebody you can count on, be it a wife, be it a good girlfriend, be it a, a good mother, a, a good father. You need someone in your life, you know, there's somebody you can count on to say everything's going to be all right. You know, we're going to get out of this. We're going to get through this. Yeah, and all the characters individually, this plays out, doesn't it? I mean, Becker talks about his relationship with Lillian, for example, doesn't he? And then, of course, there's the big thing about Becker and his son or Becker and his first wife and th- whether they're supporting each other or not and counting on them is one of the big themes, isn't it? You know, they're all looking for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very true, very true. Is this Lucille, isn't it? Lucille, Lucille, not Lillian. Lucille, your wife. Yeah, yeah. Who I think you've been with some time. You talk about when everything else is maybe lost. You look around. The only thing that's important is each other, is her. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You know, and and that's because he's been with Lucille for 17 years. So that's three years after when the mother passed away. Uh, Yeah, of course. Yeah. And what's interesting is that because we kind of talked about it a little bit in rehearsals, what type of relationship does have with Lucille as, he, as, as opposed to the relationship he had with Corinne, Bruce's mother. And I think um, Bruce's mother was the love of his life. And that's why the trauma is so real and so prevalent and so immediate to Becca. Whereas the relationship we decided he has with Lucille is more a loving, understanding relationship. Yes. But it's secure. It's a rock of some sort. It's solid. It's real. They're for each other. They have been there for each other for 17 years. Solid as a rock. That's why, you know, he says to Youngblood, you know, look, if you ever get in a situation, do like I do. Don't put your business out there. If you if you and your business have a disagreement, sleep on the couch, my friend. But mm-hmm. keep it in your home. Don't take your business out on the street. That's what he says. And that's, and that's really good fatherly advice i wanted to get we are just about out of time so i wanted to just fast forward to the ending of the play and try not to give too many spoilers away but in principle what do you think is signified at the end of the play you know we have the challenge where the whole of the business is going to fall apart potentially but booster comes in and the last action of the play is he answers the phone to a customer are you thinking is this business going to survive what's the future what do you think we take away? What does the future look like? What are we thinking at that point? Uh, well, no, that's very interesting. I think that people will, will have to take away their own individual thoughts about what will happen to that jitney station and what will happen to that group of men. Will they survive? It's an unanswered question. But they're going to fight. They are going to fight. They're not going to give up. I mean, I yeah. mean that's, that's what I take away from the end of the play. Is yeah. That despite whatever's going on, do not give up. Keep going. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, there's a sort of sense of continuity, isn't there? Because Booster the Sun... Yeah, he's passing the baton. Steps in and takes up the mantle. Yeah. Yeah. There's something lovely about that, so that the fight will go on. Yeah. 
Oh, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me today and for sharing your insights. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you also for your performances as well. <laughs> it's an absolutely wonderful production, full of emotion, funny, joyous, thoughtful, poignant, in no small part because of your performances. And if you, I'm going to say to listeners, if you haven't seen it and you're listening to this before the 9th of July, I heartily recommend you go. So break a leg tonight, chaps. Great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Pleasure. You. Thank you. As the curtain falls on the threatened Jitney office and the crew, what are the chances that they will withstand the onslaught of the city developers? Will they still be working together or drift away on their own paths? Young blood to school, he and Reina to their new neighborhood, Booster and the others to who knows where. There's no knowing other than that each and all of them have a better chance if they have somebody they can count on. Thanks for listening. See you next time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening. To listen to other episodes, to find out news about future episodes, or to leave comments about what you've heard, please visit us at www.theplaypodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at The Play Pod. You're also welcome to email plays at theplaypodcast.com to suggest plays that we could talk about in future episodes. You can also register your suggestion on the website. Thanks again and see you next time.